I now present ambiguity theories that are alternative to things that we saw before. So things outside and after the textbook, the well, textbook was 2011, so many things have happened since. This will be in a separate PowerPoint file. And because you have no textbook on it, the file will be more verbose. You have to learn uh, things from this presentation and the PowerPoint file. That's why it is more verbose. You, you can read it. Um, I should say, I, this is about the field I'm working myself. I'm not a neutral outside observer. I have my opinions, um, so I can't claim to be neutral. So you get the opinionated presentation. Well, the stage where the ambiguity field is in today, in biology, you have the term adapt adaptive radiation for such a stage. And adaptive radiation happens, for instance, if a catastrophe happened on our planet and almost all living beings have become extinct, have died. So then there are many, there are many places available for life forms to develop many niches, so to say. So then, indeed, after such a mass extinction, many new life forms develop, but there's a much of the diversity variation. Many strange, diverse forms come about. That happens in the, in the first stage. Then after, when there are too many forms, so to say, competition sets in, and then the best forms survive, remain, and they perfection themselves, but most of the other forms disappear. So then usually diversity decreases after a while. Well, we've seen it a bit in decision-making on the risk in the 1980s, 1990s. Many non-expected utility models were introduced, but only a few prospect theory and a little bit uh, disappointment aversion theory have remained, and the others have disappeared more or less. So there's quite some consensus in the field nowadays about it. For ambiguity, we're not there yet. And ambiguity, there may be there are many models uh, for ambiguity available today, and in a way, maybe even too many, because if somebody uh, wants to apply, is interested in using these models, well, then there are 15 models. Which one should you use? And if they give different uh, results, uh, which one should you believe? That's a bit inconvenient. So we have to work more and probably converge more in the future. But then there will be tests and analysis, and time will tell. We have to do this, of course. And then uh, a new generation of researchers may help in proceeding here. And uh, maybe listeners to this uh, recording can also contribute and do research work on these topics because we need that, of course. Well, some opinions that I have about the ambiguity models nowadays, non-neutral opinions. Um, many models, many theoretical models are being introduced, but usually there's not much communication between theoretically and empirically oriented people. And many of these theoretical models, they don't fit well with empirical findings. There's no, not many attempts to fit with that. So that's one point where the field is weak and needs more work to come. It may be it is justified, could be just for some authors may say that their model is normatively motivated. And so that's another reason to, but then uh, I already said before, people don't write much about it. I find it a bit, uh, I don't fully understand it often how this is. Another problem that I have with the current field, I already said before also, too much focus on the Ellsberg urns. They are not representative for natural ambiguity, I think. So we should study the different events. Also too much focus on ambiguity aversion. I think surely in Berkeley, many other things are happening, not so much. But almost all the theoretical papers only focus on this aversion the component as yet. And for instance, almost no paper has uh, analysis, discussion of insensitivity, but the data imposes upon us. We have to analyze it surely for empirical work. And uh, I already said, uh, you know, I'm a Bayesian, I think, expect you that it's a like normative model. So I can only work empirically, descriptively on these models, and that is what I do. Well, outline of what we will do, do next in this presentation. First, I will introduce to you the ansgar Amman framework for decision under uncertainty. Then some models that use it, I and mean, let's not read all these things, we'll see it when we come to them. And in the end, a short comment on applications. That's what I'm going to present now. So this ansgar Amman framework is very popular. Almost all theoretical papers in the field nowadays use that framework. In fact, Anscombe Almond themselves had a somewhat more general framework. Later, it was Fishburn who simplified it and made it uh, more tractable. That's the framework that people use uh, nowadays. But the people uh, feel so called the Anscombe Almond framework, so let us follow the terminology of the field. In this framework, acts do not assign just outcomes to states of nature. That was what we did so far. Acts assign outcomes, they were usually money amounts. But in the Anscombe Almond framework, it's a bit more complex. 
if you have an act and a state of nature results, you get not an, an outcome, but you get the property distribution over money amounts, maybe. Let me call them prizes to avoid confusion. So not deterministic outcomes result, but probability distributions over money amounts, call them prices. That means that it is in fact a two-stage uh, approach. The uncertainty is resolved in two stages. Let me depict it. The first stage uh, is where the state space, where it is determined which state of nature is true. There's a terminological convention in the field to take a special example of a state space, to assume that the state, state space concerns a horse race taking place. You don't know which horse will win. It will be one of them. And then, so the horse is uh, the symbol of state of nature. So people often use that example and use it commonly as terminology. So let us also do it. So we assume now the example of the state space where it is a horse race. But that happens in the first stage, uh, one horse will win. After that being determined, you don't yet know what money amount an act will give you because it then results a probability distribution over uh, the money amounts. People usually use the term roulette wheel for that. They say, this is the uncertainty of the roulette wheel. That's one way to generate probabilities. And the field commonly uses that term. So we do it too. That's the stage of the roulette wheel. So here the probability distribution is played out. And then in the end, after that is resolved, you know which price you get. For every horse, there's a different probability distribution over the prices. So this first stage, that's where the ambiguity, the uncertainty plays a role. And that's what is of central interest. That's what we want to understand, analyze, and do. The probability is in the second stage. It's not so much that we are curious about and want to analyze them. They're more, we, we voluntarily add them as an auxiliary tool. When we have those available, all kind of mathematics becomes easier. And that's the main reason that people introduce that second stage. So it's not the central interest of our research, but it's an auxiliary tool to get more insights into what happens in the first stage. And what I said, now I rewrite them here on the slides because the slides are a bit verbose, I told you before, but I already said these things, so let us move on. Now the evaluation of such two-stage objects, here I repeat the two-stage object of the previous slide, how it is usually assumed that is first in uh, those lotteries, the probability distribution in the second stage, people assume that expected utility uh, governs, uh, gives the right evaluations. So what they often do is then usually they replace every lottery by a certainty equivalent as it uh, comes with the expected utility model. But according to the expected utility model, as a certainty equivalent, they substitute. They do that for every uh, horse. And what results is every lottery has been replaced by its certainty equivalent. And it is assumed that that is uh, equivalent to what we had before. So now here we have quite like with the things that we studied in this course. For every horse, there's a money amount. Uh, sorry, how is the state of nature, of course. For every horse, there's a money amount that you get, a fixed money amount. So that's a degenerate probability distribution. After that done, uh, comes the evaluation of this object here. And here, uh, uncertainty and ambiguity play a role. And that's a thing of central interest to people. So this is how uh, sort of a two-stage evaluation that people use uh, to evaluate these two-stage objects in the Anscombe Amon framework. So if I compare to the the, you know, the book structures of one two point one formula, and that was what in fact that is a savage he used that framework. There we had uh, outcomes were evaluated by utilities, but now well, what we have instead of the outcomes is uh, lotteries, and they are evaluated by expected utilities. So that's a replacement that is taking place here. Now that expected utility in the second stage, that is linear in probability, as you know, that functional, that is mathematically convenient. Uh, the Anscombe Almond, so this linearity makes a lot of mathematics easier. That's why people like this framework so much. In a way, the Anscombe Almond framework gives you linear utility without committing to linear utility, because the utility of money still can be non-linear, it's allowed. But you have linearity and probability, so you can still use that linearity. That's the big reason that the one framework is so popular, therefore people work theoretically. But there are a number of problems. It's less popular with me than with the average field, uh, maybe. There are some problems for that framework, descriptive and normative. Two problems. One is that expected utility for risk is a questionable thing, especially if you want to do empirical work, descriptive work. We know, we discussed a lot that it's much violated, so uh, it doesn't work very well empirically. We have all kinds of alternative theories, uh, alternative to expected utility, to better capture risk attitudes. So that's already a weak point, surely, for empirical work. 
Uh, it may happen some authors that work on ambiguity, they say they do it for normative reasons, and then they may say that they consider expert utility to be a normative model for risk, or maybe not for ambiguity, but just for risk, a standard point of view. That could be one way to justify doing this. Well, in a second, uh, second objection is that this uh, certainty equivalent substitution that I told you, that's a form of backward induction. And maybe backward induction is completely obvious, self-evident and uncontroversial in classical models and expected utility. But as uncontroversial as it is there, so controversial it is on a non-expected utility. If at the moment you may apply non-expected utility to dynamic situations, dynamic evaluations, big problems arise. A thing that seemed to be self-evident in classical models, suddenly you have to give up one or two of such things. And indeed, many people have argued that uh, doing backward induction in non-EU is questionable. Well, some have defended it, saying, if you, you know, if you say you work on ambiguity normatively, you can say, I think that for a non-expected utility dynamic optimization, backward induction is the normative thing to do. But there are debates about that, but uh, Berkeley is really much violated. But for instance, Mark Machine, when he, when he wrote a paper where he argued for a normative, uh, non-expected utility for risk. And he had also normative objections against backward induction. He thought rational persons should not do that. So you see, it's this is another questionable. Maybe I didn't list the third, the third quite difficult thing is if you do empirical work, these two stage objects are often too complex for subjects. That could be a third objection against the model. Anyway, it's, uh, it doesn't come free of charge. So here's this backward induction. I already showed you that Machina criticizes it. There are many other people who discuss and criticize it normatively in general. Now, in the special context of Enscom Alman framework, it has been discussed also recently by many authors. They showed it's not at all as innocent as may seem, because Enscom Alman, they call it monotonicity. That's a misleading term. Monotonicity is often a self evident term, but this is more. For if it, it's more weak separability for those of you who know what the word term means, it's quite restrictive assumption. And then many people criticize it, and both normatively and descriptively. And yeah, there's the annotated bibliography on my homepage as a keyword there where you can find many papers discussing it in the context of Enscom Almond. So that is also a problematic aspect. Now I'm going to, after this, I'm going to present all kind of ambiguity theories to you, alternative to what we did before. They have almost all of the literature been formulated in the Anscom Alman framework. For most of them, or all of them, that's not necessary. You could also formulate it in a savage framework. But I'll stay close with the literature. And I will present them to you also in the Anscom Alman framework. That will come in next recordings.